from again that, watching but, live um, pictures uh, over the over the skies of Baghdad today this anti artillery fire anti aircraft fire uh, it's our understanding that cruise missiles have struck targeted targets inside Iraq that the uh, the troops are on the move though we cannot confirm yet that they've made their way into Baghdad speculation about whether this might have been the beginning of shock Shock and awe, and, and we can tell you that it is not. According to our Pentagon correspondent, Brett Baer, our Washington managing editor, Britt Hume, is monitoring developments from our Washington. First attack, the concentrated strike, believed to have been an attack on the presidential palace with a number of missiles. Our correspondent, David Shader, one of the few correspondents remaining inside Baghdad, is speaking right now and watching the night sky. Let's listen to David managed, the U.S. troops have managed uh, to put out at least some of those and secure others. We can also report that there is resistance currently in the city of Basra, that is the southern port city. Uh, it is currently ongoing. U.S. troops engaged in firefights there. We're trying to get some uh, visibility as far as how intense that fighting is, uh, but we can tell you that boots on the ground in the south, north, and west are now uh, moving to encircle Baghdad as this air campaign, this massive bombardment, what has been called shock and awe, uh, starts in the city of Baghdad tonight. Chip? Brett, Brett, thanks very much. Uh, still looking live on a night scope camera in Baghdad. Uh, General, General McInerney, the beginning yeah. of this with the presidential palace and then moving out for, from there, is this is a large part of this still psychological for leaders, or have we reached a point now uh, where this campaign continues until the administration at least believes that it's accomplished its goal? I believe we're going to continue until it accomplishes its goal, Shep. The important thing, and you're seeing the difference between this time and last time, those were B-2s that dropped those bombs. There were looked like six bunker penetrators. Uh, 2,000 pound bombs, the cruise missile is uh, a lot smaller and it can't penetrate like the uh, JDAM, the Joint Direct Attack Munition can. And, and that's why you saw those huge explosions around the palace. Only the B-2, the B-2 can drop 16 at once if it wanted. You can imagine 16 B-2s could drop 256 bombs like that with that kind of effect. That is shock and that is awesome. Not something you do in the center of a city, though. I, I'm guessing if that sort of thing were happening, it happened on the outskirts, right? Uh, those bombs were dropped on the palace. So that's right in the center of the city. And, and I hope our good friend Kim Jong-il is looking at this, because uh, this is a capability that we really haven't unleashed the full maximum capability, I assure you. We're certainly going to get more information about what we've done so far far in just about uh, 11 minutes when uh, the Pentagon briefing begins. Brett Baer has gone off to that briefing. General, what would you suspect that we might hear from them now? I'm guessing that much of the message from this briefing may be from the, for the command and control inside Baghdad. Exactly, Shep. Uh, right now, the communications are going hot and heavy, I'm sure, on how they can negotiate a capitulation or a surrender. As I said earlier, we have two divisions that are still, I think, not moving forward, and that's Hammurabi and Nebuchadnezzar, two Republican Guard divisions. And that's what the third ID will face tomorrow in the 101st. But I, I think it's important to know that their leadership is, is probably so much in disarray that they're having difficulty for one person speaking for, for the government, and that's probably their problem right now. Shep. It's Brett. Can I just get in to ask a Please. question here to, yeah, to General McInerney? General, uh, we've seen this lull now develop, how long it will last uh, is anybody's guess, but uh, is it your sense that this is really, you've talked about how we, we have not yet seen the full might of this. Your sense is that this is just the beginning? Uh, is, there a, is, a, is a lull possibly planned? Is there an opportunity for communication from uh, Republican Guard uh, divisions? Uh, what do you think? Well, Brett, it's hard to tell. You, you saw, for the first time, JDAMs and these precision weapons hitting with such force. If they've gotten most of the targets in the center of town, because there's a limitation how many there are, uh, I'm not sure how much more we'll see like this. But if there are more available targets, you know, there were a total of 7,000 targets in the whole uh, country. 3,000 were supposed to hit in the early days of this campaign. 
Now, how many? I suspect there are probably less than 100 in Baghdad itself that we're going to hit. But I do think, as I said at the start of the program, between now and 6 o'clock, we're going to see these waves of, uh, of uh, B-2s and stealth, bomb, uh, stealth fighters and tomahawks coming in, which are virtually invulnerable to any of their defenses. We have not seen any SAMs being fired, and they're firing all their AAA in barrage fire. They aren't seeing anything. They're just pulling the trigger. I'm just guessing, hoping. Yes. Yes, now, hoping me, for the golden BB. Now, we've heard that, uh, that uh, the uh, ground forces have encountered resistance in the area around Basra, and there had been some hopes that Basra would fall rather quickly. What kind of Iraqi forces are down there? Are there, are there elite Republican Guard units down there, or is this the, uh, the much derided regular army that's down there? This is the much derided regular army, three and four corps. I'm a little surprised that they are fighting and meeting that resistance uh, because it is a, a Shiite city, and I thought that they would rise up. So I'm not entirely familiar with what's going on, but I am surprised that uh, they are meeting the resistance they're meeting. Of course, in the early stages like this of a, of a campaign for a city like that, I guess it's hard to tell what's happening. Uh, the, proverbial, the proverbial fog of war, I suppose, envelops everyone. Yes, it does, Britt. And, and I would just like to repeat again what you and General Moore were talking about. We have left the lights on, even though there is some uh, risk to us to do it, because we want the Iraqi people to know it's not them we're after. We're after this regime change. In addition, it's a powerful view to the rest of the world of, of what we mean and why we're going to take this regime down. I still believe, I still believe we're going to have a much smaller number of casualties than we did last time. What, what are Sounds those? Sounds like uh, secondary. Th what those are cruise missiles, I believe. You can tell by the I sound? I believe wow. those are cruise missiles. Uh, it, it, I'm just taking a guess because I haven't seen the explosion. If I could see the explosion, I could tell you what it was. Well, we keep looking yeah, for Yeah, I, I did. We keep looking for a no, camera that might show it. No, I got the sound on it. You can tell the sound and the uh, and the and the, the explosion if you see it. Uh, since I didn't see it and I don't know where the uh, the telephone is, it's kind of hard to tell exactly. But these sound like they're smaller than 2,000-pound bombs. These sound like cruise missiles. It's fascinating and amazing to listen to this and see this with the lights on in Baghdad. I mean, I suppose the lights don't make any difference to us because our stuff is mostly guided by, uh, uh, by a computer, right? We, we don't care about the lights. As a matter of fact, we do care. We want to watch this. And again, we want to send a signal to the Iraqi people. It's not you we're after. We're after your regime. And as soon as you change it, then as soon as we liberate you, it's going to be your life. And so uh, it is amazing. It's probably the first time in the history of warfare, Britt, that they've ever left the lights on like this. But it was a very conscious decision by the President and the Secretary of Defense, which I applaud. Speaking of the Secretary of Defense, I want to remind our viewers, just about five minutes from now, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld will hold a news conference, a live briefing from the Pentagon, and Fox News will bring that to you live. General Moore, as we sit here and watch this, um, lights on, uh, enormous explosions, they seem to come in waves, uh, anti-aircraft fire that can't seem to do much. Uh, what uh, the great worry, of course, has been all along that the uh, ground forces would encounter very stiff resistance uh, when they reach Baghdad, uh, and that house by you know people have conjured up visions of bloody house-to-house -house warfare, untold civilian casualties, and so on. What can the bombing campaign, that uh, apart from uh, getting everybody to surrender, but from a military point of view, what can a bombing campaign like this on a city do? Uh, to eliminate that kind of resistance. Well, in this particular instance, the, the key here is to take out the leadership, to capitate the leadership from its body, and also to eliminate their ability to talk. Now, as far as uh, having to go house to house, I think the plan is here that if we take out the Hammurabi, the Nebuchadnezzar, and the other Republican Guard, and now they're on, out, on, now on they're the out west of the city, on right? the outskirts of right. Baghdad, then Baghdad itself, particularly if Sodom and the regime has fallen, uh, will not offer much resistance. I, I don't think, at least in my mind, that I have ever envisioned 
going house to house, door to door, much like we saw in World War II. Now, you would imagine, I presume, that the uh, that Republican Guard uh, barracks, if there are any above ground Republican Guard barracks out in those uh, out in those other places, Nebuchadnezzar, ha uh, Hammurabi, that you and General McInerney have been talking about, I assume they'll be targets. Tonight. Those have been hit. Those are those are are they will be if they have not been. And part of this might be this message that we're still trying to uh, to get from the senior Republican Guard leadership. Will you stop? And and this could be. Uh, In other words, they don't, you don't hit them yet. You give them a further chance. That's right. That's right. And and uh, does anyone know if there are Republican Guard uh, barracks in in Baghdad, places that can be hit, where we're assured that uh, that uh, those kinds of military targets uh, are available? Well, in looking uh, at some of the Fox flyover shots that we've we've used in the past, there are several that are right in the outskirts of Baghdad. It's a little hard to tell whether they're east, north. I think they're probably on on both sides. But the bulk of the Republican Guard is, uh, forces here have set themselves up south and slightly southwest of Baghdad. Well, we're a little bit out of town. They're outside of, uh, you know, on the Euphrates River. We're so. about a couple minutes away from the uh, briefing from General Myers and Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld. It'll be interesting to see when they come in uh, how much they're willing to say. I rather expect that both men will have a statement of some kind about the nature of the campaign that will be coupled with further urgings of uh, Iraqi commanders to give up. Uh, it'll be interesting to hear what other message. Secretary Rumsfeld and General Myers have been very careful, much more careful than some other Pentagon officials have been, about the uh, scope of what they're willing to say. Um, Sec General uh, Secretary Rumsfeld has been willing to walk up to cameras, but uh, he hasn't been willing to say much, which I think is what you'd expect. But uh, the Pentagon briefing room is very crowded right now, uh, and we're able to see it here on one of the monitors in Washington, but the Secretary and General Myers have yet to walk in. We will, of course, go to them immediately at the same time time we'll Rick. be able to keep an eye on the scene in the skies over Baghdad. Yeah, Chef. Rick, we've been able to reconnect with our correspondent David Shader in Baghdad while we wait for the uh, for the defense secretary and the general. Let, let's listen to him for a second. And it just goes, goes to show that here it comes right here. Another waiting for the blast wave to come. But uh, these do look like uh, like bombs. It's very hard to tell uh, for me. I don't know what they're, they're actually hitting. Uh, but uh, now serious fires um, throughout uh, the central arc directly in front of me. Uh, these are government targets, government buildings. The aim to uh, paralyze command and control, which comes from Baghdad, which is under the control of um, Saddam Hussein's younger son. Uh, hang on, hang on. Okay, I've got to go. Right, David. Uh, David Traitor reporting there, and obviously uh, for security reasons, having and to live move pictures positions you're seeing uh, from uh, Sky uh, News, our sister network in the United uh, Kingdom, and uh, that large plume of smoke uh, rising over the night sky. David Shader was reporting seconds ago that the, the, the targeting he appears to him at least to be very narrowly targeted, uh, that they are hitting specific buildings, buildings with which David Shader was familiar to some degree for, from his reporting there inside Baghdad. Uh, not any sort of random bombing at all, but more uh, targeted, beginning the very first blast, he said, targeting Saddam Hussein's presidential palace, one that I might add he rarely visited, according to reports from inside Baghdad, but certainly the main palace of Saddam Hussein inside the city. And live pictures now coming to us through the facilities of Abu Dhabi television and more explosions happening in the night sky. It would be interesting, General McInerney, to see whether over the next few minutes, as, as Secretary Rumsfeld and General Myers begin to speak, if, if they might give this particular bombing campaign a bit of a breather so that those who are watching in enemy territory might be able to listen to what they have to say. And we'll find out, certainly in time, whether something like that does happen. Uh, sure. after, after the very first strike, of course, on Saddam's palace, there was a, a, a brief a break, Brit Hume, for about, what, five or ten minutes where nothing happened, and then away they went again. Well, of course, if cruise missiles are in the air, then uh, there's no way to turn them back that I know of. Or is there? General, General McInerney stepped away, but uh, Shep, uh, let's put that question to, to General uh, Burt Moore, who's still with us here. Uh, what about that? Uh, uh, I suggested to General McInerney the possibility you do a lull hoping for, uh, hoping for an answer from uh, Republican Guard headquarters of some kind. Is it, is it possible to, to sp suspend these things once you've unleashed them? Well, with the Tomahawk cruise missile, we've made some dramatic technological changes and improvements, and now 
they do have a capability with the global positioning system uh, navigation capability. They can send this uh, cruise missile out. It can loiter. It can be reprogrammed in the air, and it can wait for a call maybe for a secondary target, or it could be sent on its way to uh, go down in some uninhabited area if you mm. decide not to I don't want to let my imagination run away with me here, but presumably you could be in a situation where you're on the phone with a guy and say, look, that thing is on the way to you. Uh, you may see it go by the window. When you do, if you surrender, we'll redirect it away from you, and if not, we'll redirect it back down your chimney. Yeah, that might be a that might be a little too far along. Uh, but on the and of course, yeah. not all Tomahawk cruise missiles have this do that. capability, right. but but there are a, a large number that do. Well, one wonders why there's been a slight delay, just a slight delay in the beginning of that briefing, uh, Shep. But uh, it is an interesting question about these l lulls now. Is it right to interpret this as a lull in the bombing or simply the time between the waves and, the, and, and this is the way bombing campaigns normally unfold? I would believe it's more a time, a lull between the waves. You, you recall that we don't have all the Saudi Arabian bases to fly combat operations out of. We have uh, support operations. So we have some narrower corridors. Uh, we probably have an air traffic control situation, as you can imagine, putting thousand airplanes uh, to make sure they are not conflicted with other aircraft it takes a, a lot of planning and so it's a little easier to bring a wave in kind of clear the, them area, out of the area bring sure. another wave in. Now, I assume that they're going back reloading getting new bombs and I mean uh, start all over again. A uh, number of, uh, will the, will the, uh, will the, will the planes that are flying out of uh, Saudi Arabia for example be capable of running a number of sorties tonight? Uh, it, it'd be a long night but yes they could they could turn them it depends on where they go and, and uh, what happens to them when they get there. But, you, uh, did Jeff, but one other note, uh, when we go, when we listen to Into Skies reporting and we hear uh, David Shader's sort of unmistakable voice there, uh, you can tell he's in Baghdad just from the sense of urgency in his voice. That other voice, uh, I believe, Shep, is that of Jeremy Thompson, who is, is a veteran broadcaster there that I guess both of us have talked to on the air a number of times. Uh, and Jeremy's kind of the principal uh, lead anchor, one of the most seasoned guys in the country uh, for Sky News, spent many years with uh, He's been with BBC, ITN, and now Sky, where he's a major figure. That's just a note just for information purposes. Interesting to note that we're talking about a lull in Baghdad, and, and the picture, though, it, it, it tells a thousand stories. It doesn't tell all of them. We're, we're getting reports from our correspondent in northern Iraq that there is a, a, a bombing campaign happening in the city of Kirkuk. Uh, there are other bombing campaigns happening around the country, and though we, can, we have unprecedented access to be able to see what's happening in Iraq, we don't see it all. Uh, this campaign is much larger than the city of Baghdad, the second largest city in the north and the third largest city in the south, which has already been taken over. Uh, an enormous operation. Baghdad, a city of 5 million, and the, and the country, city of, uh, country of 23 million. So it, th there's a lot of work to be done here. And I've just been informed we're about 30 seconds away now from General, General Myers and Secretary Rumsfeld at the uh, Pentagon. And, and Britt, I guess one of the more interesting things that I'm reading here, at least, is this, are these dispatches from David Shader, who seems absolutely confident that they're taking out buildings one by one. And, and from his reporting, at least, it sounds as if the, the accuracy is pinpoint. Well, that's, of course, what we've come to expect, Shep. And one of the things that uh, the military has uh, said to us now over the past dozen years since the end of the Gulf War, when we all got the idea that all of those weapons, or at least a great many of them, were pretty precise. Actually, only a fraction of them were precision guided in those days. Nowadays, a much higher uh, percentage of the munitions used are precision guided, and the precise level of precision is much greater. So this, uh, if this is what uh, we're seeing tonight, this is what we have been uh, told that we should expect as we continue to await the arrival of the Secretary of Defense and his uh, Joint Chiefs Chairman in the briefing room. And perhaps they, they will be able to say a little bit more to us about that, although um, uh, one can never tell uh, what the extent of this extent of this briefing will be. Perhaps. Uh, one, one more thing I want to get in before he does get started, Britt, and that is that the Al Jazeera television network is reporting that the uh, Iraqi defense minister will be speaking live on television in Iraq in a short time, and if in fact we see that, we'll update you on what happened. Well, of course, and, and, and Shep, it's worth noting earlier that some official in Baghdad was saying uh, earlier today that uh, uh, he could guarantee that there was not a single American soldier on Iraqi soil, and of course at that time we were watching on live television that column of uh, that uh, that our correspondent, uh, one of our correspondents, was traveling with, which was rolling up through the through the sort of the spine of the western part of uh, the central western part of of Iraq. So that was kind of extraordinary. It is, it is always fascinating in a way to watch these Iraqi spokesmen and the, and the things that they're willing to say. Sometimes uh, you can't tell uh, whether they're true or not, and sometimes you know absolutely for sure they're not true. 
true. And, in, and, and at the moment that Iraqi uh, defense minister, I'm told now, is speaking, our translator is translating and our producers are listening. And if there's anything of note that, that comes outside the realm of propaganda, in fact, there it is. Uh, we're looking live now through the, through the facilities of, I believe, Al Jazeera television. At any rate, the defense minister is speaking and giving an update to the Iraqi people, but I think the more interesting will be uh, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld and General, and General Myers, who are now entering the briefing room, it is my understanding, in Washington. So for that, Britt, I'll toss it over to you. All right, well, good. we continue to await them. They, they gave us about a minute warning uh, several minutes ago, but here they come now. <coughs> Good afternoon. Uh, yesterday, four American Marines and eight members of the British Armed Forces were killed in a helicopter accident uh, returning from a mission in Iraq. And in a separate incident, a U.S. Marine was killed in action during combat operations in Iraq. We are certainly grateful for their lives, their courage, and their sacrifice, and our hearts go out to their families. The world will be a safer place because of their dedicated service. On the President's order, coalition forces began the ground war to disarm Iraq and liberate the Iraqi people uh, yesterday. And a few minutes ago, the air war in Iraq began. General Myers will provide some details on the progress of our operation, but first let me comment on the aims and objectives we have for the days ahead. Our goal is to defend the American people and to eliminate Iraq's weapons of mass destruction and to liberate the Iraqi people. Coalition military operations are focused on achieving several specific objectives. To end the regime of Saddam Hussein by striking with force on a scope and scale that makes clear to Iraqis that he and his regime are finished. Next, to identify, isolate, and eventually eliminate Iraq's weapons of mass destruction, their delivery systems, production capabilities, and distribution networks. Third, to search for, capture, drive out terrorists who have found safe harbor in Iraq. Fourth, to collect such intelligence as we can find related to terrorist networks in Iraq and beyond. Fifth, to collect such intelligence as we can find related to the global network of illicit weapons of mass destruction activity. Sixth, to end sanctions and to immediately deliver humanitarian relief, food and medicine to the displaced and to the many needy Iraqi citizens. Seventh, to secure Iraq's oil fields and resources which belong to the Iraqi people and which they will need to develop their country after decades of a neglect by the Iraqi regime. And last, to help the Iraqi people create the conditions for a rapid transition to a representative self-government that is not a threat to its neighbors and is committed to ensuring the territorial integrity of that country. The regime is starting to lose control of their country. Yesterday, the Iraqi information minister declared that the port of Umm Qasar is completely in our hands, quote unquote. Quote, they, the coalition forces, failed to capture it, unquote. In fact, coalition forces did capture it and do control the port of Umm Qasar and also a growing portion of the country of Iraq. The confusion of Iraqi officials is growing. Their ability to see what is happening on the battlefield, to communicate with their forces, and to control their country is slipping away. They're beginning to realize, I suspect, that the regime is history. And as that realization sets in, their behavior is likely to begin to tip and to change. Those close to Saddam Hussein will likely begin searching for a way to save themselves. Those whose obedience is based on fear may well begin to lose their fear of him. Officers and soldiers in the field will increasingly see that their interests lie not in dying for a doomed regime, but in helping the forces 
of Iraq's liberation. To those in the Iraqi chain of command, some words of advice. Do not obey regime orders to use weapons of mass destruction. Do not obey orders to use innocent civilians as human shields. Do not follow orders to destroy any more of Iraq's oil wells or to blow up dams or to flood villages. Those who carry out such orders will be found and will be punished. We are especially grateful for the direct military involvement of the forces of Great Britain and Australia and Poland and so many other countries. And we are deeply grateful for the support of each of the now 45 nations that have publicly associated themselves with the coalition effort in Iraq. We did not choose this war. Saddam Hussein was given a choice by the international community. Give up your weapons of mass murder or lose power. He chose unwisely, and now he will lose both. As in Afghanistan, our objective in Iraq is not conquest or colonization. Iraq belongs to the Iraqi people. Our objective is to bring down a regime that threatens the American people with weapons of mass destruction and create conditions where Iraqis can establish a new government, one that respects the rights of its diverse population and the aspirations of all Iraqis to live in freedom and to choose their own leaders. To American forces and those of our coalition partners, let me say this. Know that we are proud of you, that we stand with you today. We have every confidence in your courage, your tenacity, and your ability to get this job done. All Americans hold you and your families in our thoughts and prayers today. General Myers. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I, too, want to extend my deepest condolences to the families of the Marines, both U.S. and our British allies, who died in the helicopter crash yesterday, and to the family of the Marine killed in action earlier this morning. These brave men died fighting for their nation and the safety of the world. Operation Iraqi Freedom, our effort to disarm Iraq and dismantle the Iraqi regime, is fully underway. But before I go into that, I want to recap what has happened in the last 40, 48 hours and how we got to where we are now. On Wednesday afternoon, we conducted early battlefield preparations by taking out air defense threats, radar, communication sites, and artillery that could pose a threat to coalition forces. Some of these targets included radars in western Iraq and near Basra and southern Iraq, artillery pieces near the al Fah and al Zabar near Kuwait, and surface-to-surface -surface missiles in the south. Later Wednesday evening, coalition forces began inserting special operations forces throughout western and southern Iraq to conduct reconnaissance operations and take down visual observation posts on the southern Iraqi border. At the same time, as we briefed yesterday, we took advantage of a leadership target of opportunity in Baghdad. Specifically, we struck at one of the residences in southeastern Baghdad where we thought the leadership was congregated. Uh, we also took down uh, a struck intelligence service headquarters in Baghdad and a Republican Guard facility. They were targeted with nearly 40, 40 Tomahawk land attack cruise missiles from coalition ships in the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. Two Air Force F-117s also dropped precision-guided 2,000-pound penetration weapons on these leadership targets. Then yesterday, we launched more than 20 T-Lands against eight targets in Baghdad which included several Baghdad special security organization sites. And as most of you know, the special security organization is that organization that protects the senior Iraqi leadership. Also on Thursday, coalition ships launched some 10 TLAMs against three Republican Guard targets in Kirkuk in the north. In the last 24 hours, special forces have seized an airfield in western Iraq and have secured border positions in several key locations. Additionally, Navy SEALs and Coalition Special Forces have seized Iraq's two major gas and oil terminals in the northern Persian Gulf. There were embedded media uh, with the SEALs, and their reports should be out uh, shortly. I also have a graphic, I think, as I'll bring it up, and it's up now. Good. Coalition ships boarded three Iraqi tugboats in the Khor Abdallah waterway and found weapons, 
uniforms, and mines. Over 130 mines, including influence mines, were discovered. Our naval vessels are being extra vigilant to ensure the Iraqi Navy has not placed any mines in international waters. On the ground, as you know, the First Marine Expeditionary Force, along with our coalition partners, crossed into Iraq, and they have now secured the port city of Am Qasr and the Al-Fal Peninsula. They have also secured the main oil manifolds along the Al-Fal waterways and have moved through the southern Iraqi oil fields. These fields, if we're successful, should be secured sometime later today. And they will be a great resource for the Iraqi people as they build a free society. Last night at approximately 10 p.m. Eastern Time, the rest of the ground campaign began in earnest when the 3rd Infantry Division rolled into southern Iraq. There's been a lot of reporting on this, of course, uh, with some of the embedded media. At this hour, our ground forces have pushed close to 100 miles inside Iraq. Since Operation Iraqi Freedom began, coalition aircraft have flown more than 1,000 sorties and dropped scores of precision guided munitions on Iraqi military targets. I have two gun camera shots from yesterday. Both are from F-14s as they dropped on missile targets in southern Iraq. The first is targeting a missile support vehicle. Second is an Iraqi missile storage facility in Basra. And if you note in the bottom of that picture, you'll see another fire that was hit from a previous strike from the same flight. As you've seen from the TV coverage from embedded media, clearly we're moving towards our objectives. But we must not get too comfortable. We're basically on our plan and moving towards Baghdad but there are still many unknowns out there. We have dropped millions of leaflets over Iraq telling the Iraqi people our intentions and asking the Iraqi military to lay down their arms. In fact, some Iraqi soldiers are surrendering and abandoning their positions in the south and also in the north. Clearly, many Iraqi military are heeding our message that it is better to fight for the future of Iraq than to fight for Saddam Hussein. That brings us up to date. So now within the last hour, coalition forces have launched a massive air campaign throughout Iraq. Several hundred military targets will be hit over the coming hours. But we're getting into future operations here, and I'm going to let those details be briefed by CENTCOM uh, tomorrow. Finally, I have two messages. First, to the commanders and soldiers of the Iraqi forces, I urge you in the strongest possible terms, do the honorable thing, stop fighting, that you may live enjoy a free Iraq where you and your children can grow and prosper. The second message to the men and women of our armed forces and to our allies and our coalition partners and to all their families, I salute you for your sacrifice, your courage, and your professionalism. Be confident that you are well prepared, well trained, and well supported in the mission that lies ahead. Take pride in the legitimacy and the necessity of your mission. Show compassion for the lives that this war will forever change, but rest assured the outcome is not in doubt. We will disarm the Iraqi regime and ensure their weapons of mass destruction will not fall into the hands of terrorists. And with that, we'll take your questions. Before we do, let me make one comment. Um, just before coming down after the air campaign began in earnest about one o'clock, I saw some of the images on television, and I heard various commentators expansively comparing what's taking place in Iraq today to some of the more famous uh, bombing campaigns of World War II. Uh, there is no comparison. The the weapons that are being used today have a degree of precision that no one ever dreamt of in a prior conflict. They didn't exist. And it's not a handful of weapons, it's the overwhelming majority of the weapons that have that precision. The targeting capabilities and the care that goes into targeting to see that the precise targets are struck and that 
um, other targets are not struck is as impressive as anything anyone could see. The care that goes into it, the humanity that goes into it, to see that uh, military targets are, are destroyed to be sure, um, but that uh, it's done in a way and in a manner and in a destruct in a direction and with a weapon that is appropriate to that very particularized target. And I think that the, um, the comparison is unfortunate and inaccurate. And, and I think that will be found to be the case uh, when ground truth is, is achieved. I would add also that I, I think we're probably watching something that is uh, somewhat historic. We're, we're having a conflict at a time in our history when we have uh, 24 hours a day television, radio, media, uh, internet, and more people in the world have access to what is taking place. You couple that with the hundreds, literally hundreds of people in the free press the international press, the press of the United States, from every aspect of the media, who have been offered and accepted an opportunity to join and, and be connected directly with practically every aspect of this campaign. And what we are seeing is not the war in Iraq. What we're seeing are slices of the war in Iraq. We're seeing that particularized perspective that that reporter or that commentator or that television camera happens to be able to see at that moment. And it is not what's taking place. What you see is taking place, to be sure, but it is one slice, and it is the totality of that that is what this war is about and being made up of. And, and I, don't, I doubt that, that in a conflict of this type there's ever been the degree of free press coverage uh, as you are witnessing in this instance, sir. Mr. Secretary, it's obvious from the beginning of this major air campaign and from what you all have said that there's been no general agreement by the Iraqi military leadership for a general surrender. That's for sure. Could I ask, sir, are there talks, possibly direct talks, going on between this building and the Iraqi senior military leadership toward that end? Um, in, in the way you've put it, the answer is no. If you're thinking, is there country to country dialogue taking place? And the answer is no. If you're asking, is there contact between the coalition forces and Iraqi forces, the answer is most certainly. There has been over the past period of weeks, and those discussions have intensified, but they tend to be particularized to a specific unit in a specific location. So in terms of any general surrender, they're not, you wouldn't say that they were talked strong on high levels. I answer that. <coughs> the answer is no. Secretary, Secretary, do you, Mr. Secretary, do you believe Saddam Hussein is currently in control of Iraq? I don't know. Do you have any indication that the leadership has changed hands? I, I hear scraps of information, and if I, you can be certain if I had a sufficient number of scraps that it began to make a persuasive case that I would opine on it. Can you characterize the command and control structure that you believe is in place currently inside Baghdad? Until there's good solid evidence that it doesn't exist, uh, we have to assume that it is in place and functioning in one way or another. Our hope, our expectation is that they probably had multiple methods of communicating through their command and control system. They had redundant systems. And so to the extent we are successful in eliminating some, our expectation is that even if it's simply couriers, they will have the ability to communicate. Uh, I think it's a, a stretch to think it's possible to eliminate their ability to communicate to up and down through their command system. Our hope and our prayer is not that we'll get 100% of their ability to communicate, but, but rather that we will be persuasive enough with the people who would have to implement the orders of the senior people in that regime and persuade them that it is clearly not in their interest to obey.
those types of orders. Can you help us uh, to clarify here, um, the type of people that you are in contact with represent what? Republican Guard and regular army outside of Baghdad, are you in touch with any of those inside, which is where his key uh, levels of support are? Uh, for the most part, it's outside. And, and is that Could you elaborate as much as you possibly can about uh, the fate of Saddam Hussein and the what you know so far about the success of the strike on the command headquarters? There's no question but that the strike on, on that um, leadership headquarters was successful. We have photographs of what took place. Uh, the question is, what was in there? And, and, and until uh, we gather sufficient information and intelligence and, and have more than one source uh, that gives us conviction, uh, we have to assume that uh, uh, the operation is proceeding. Do you have one source that might have perhaps seen him coming out? I don't want to get into that. Mr. Secretary, if Saddam Hussein and his sons were listening to this briefing and they wanted to give up, what precisely should they do? And is it now that the air campaign over Baghdad has begun, is it in fact too late for them to choose to go into exile? Is their only choice uh, to be captured, surrender to the United States or be killed? Is it too late for exile? It is certainly too late for them to stay in power. Uh, what they do with themselves is up to them, and what the people around them do with them is up to the people around them. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I guess time will tell what, what kinds of judgments they'll make. So far, they've made very poor judgments. What, I, you you give up? what precisely? Oh, what I don't need to give advice to that. They they know precisely what to do. You mentioned earlier the, um, the allusions to bombing campaigns in World War II, and that's an inappropriate historical analogy. Those were dumb bombs, and they were spread across large areas. Finish my point? These are very precise right. weapons. But one thing that characterized those campaigns and the bombing of, Haifa, of Hanoi was that the, the public, their spirit did not diminish. They hunkered down, and they pretty much resisted the bombing. What makes you so certain that in this case, even though it's precise, that shock and awe won't just force the Iraqis to hunker down and wait it out, like the Brits, the Germans, the Vietnamese, and the Japanese in World War II and in Vietnam? Well, for, for one thing, the, uh, the people here are, are a repressed people. Uh, anyone there, I think, uh, while it has to be a terribly unpleasant circumstance, uh, we'll have an opportunity to see the precision with which we're going about this task and that the targets are military targets and uh, that we, we, we uh, this is not an attack on the Iraqi people, it's not an attack on the country of Iraq, it's an, a, it's an attack on that regime that has refused to disarm peacefully. Uh, yes. Can I just add to that? I, I just, yeah. The Secretary is absolutely right. This is about their military capability and we have the capability in a uh, reasonably precise way to go after uh, those military targets are going to diminish their capability over time. And so we think that combined with what other things you see going on, I think I mentioned in my remarks, uh, the folks that have entered in uh, southern Iraq, we have folks in western Iraq, we have folks in the north, um, their sights are set on, on other objectives. They're not going to stay where they are, so this is a combined issue is we're not we're not counting on just the air piece you mentioned in your opening statement that you're moving along towards your objective and some of the embeds are reporting that their units have reached places before they thought they would um, is this hundred miles what you expected would you say things are going faster than you thought I would let the uh, combatant commander ca characterize that uh, when I said that I'm, I'm in in the general sense of the overall plan uh, we knew that I mean, if they had used chemical weapons at this point, that would have affected the timing and so forth. Uh, but the thing that you saw Wednesday night with the uh, uh, quick strike on a leadership target, uh, very well coordinated between all elements of this government and all elements of our U.S. Armed Forces on very short notice, is the kind of thing I think you can expect to see as this conflict unfolds. We have much greater flexibility and adaptability today, not as much as we would like but a lot more than we've ever had in a previous conflict. So whether it goes faster or slower, we'll be able to adapt. Let me go back to your last question for a minute.
important to remember that this attack is against a regime that is responsible for the death of hundreds of thousands of people. This, this is not a benign regime. This is a regime that has killed hundreds of thousands of human beings. The Makes a practice of it. Just a second. Along those lines, though, doesn't it make it more likely there'll be civilian casualties if you're going after hundreds of military targets, even though you have precision weapons? And I think a lot of people would say in this country, and particularly in Baghdad, why not make it more targeted bombing against particular sites as opposed to hundreds of sites? What is taking place today is as targeted an air campaign as has ever existed. But it makes it more likely to be civilian casualties, isn't that right? If you're we have about analyzed it. Every single target has been analyzed and the weapon has been carefully selected and the direction in which the weapon is delivered has been carefully examined and the time of day when there is the greatest prospect of minimizing any innocent lives, uh, it, it, is, it is an enormously impressive effort, a humane effort, to do, to do what is necessary to reduce this threat against our country and that region and to eliminate a regime that has killed hundreds of thousands of human beings. General Meyer, General Meyer, General Meyer Secretary, um, why do you think Saddam Hussein has not used chemical or biological weapons, and do you think that the strike Wednesday on the leadership target played any role in that? Don't know. Yes, Pam. General Myers, you mentioned uh, in your brief summary of the war actions to date uh, what is happening in southern Iraq. Can you tell us uh, what U.S. and coalition forces may be doing in the northern part of the country and to what extent uh, the Turks may have uh, crossed the border? Uh, best that I know, the uh, Turkish forces have not uh, crossed uh, the border from Turkey into northern Iraq. And in terms of the operations up there, uh, we haven't said a lot about them, and I'd prefer to leave that either to CENTCOM or just not to talk about them right now. Just one second. Just one second. I think it should be added that the Turkish forces go in and out of the northern part of Iraq and have for years, and they may have some in forces In fact, they there. have had some forces in northern Iraq for some time, not, not associated with what's going on right, right. now. You, but you but, but in terms you, of any large but, numbers, but, but, they, they are. You've repeatedly emphasized the importance of all that. Yes. Thank you. Secretary. Yes. Secretary, can you characterize the level of resistance uh, coalition forces? Feeling and is that is there a relationship between resistance and the decision to go ahead with a massive air campaign? The um, the decision to go ahead with the ground campaign and the air campaign was a direct result of the fact that the 48-hour ultimatum expired and the Saddam Hussein and his crowd did not leave the country. It is after still additional time. Um, in the hope that one might find a large number of senior military people making a conscious decision that they would prefer to act with honor and, uh, and, and separate themselves from that regime. When that did not happen, the only choice one has is to proceed and use coercion. Uh, it, is, it was the absolute last choice after every single other thing that could be done had been done. So, Mr. Secretary, is the second deadline issued then for the senior Iraqi official to surrender by a certain time? No, there was no certain time. There was time provided, as you are well aware. The president spoke, I believe, and gave a 48-hour ultimatum on Monday, Eastern Standard Time, uh, 8.14. It came out of his mouth. By Wednesday, 48 hours had expired. Uh, today is, what, Friday. The ground campaign began last evening, uh, at about 10 o'clock. And the air campaign began today about 1 o'clock. Uh, we have been issuing, a through a variety of methods, communications urging the Iraqi military to surrender. And uh, it's it apparently uh, it, what we have done thus far has not been sufficiently persuasive that they would have done that. It may very well be that with the initiation of the ground war uh, last evening and the initiation of the air war uh, this afternoon uh, that we may find the sky.